but I really liked the metaphor that emerged. And this wasn't the metaphor you used, but it was my interpretation of what you were saying. Okay. But I actually want to go back to what you were, you're speaking to, but it was around capacity. And I think this idea of balance and growth um, around like when uncertainty hits, but if it hits in like sequence. And so yeah. what are the things that you have found on the regular that are front-loaded training so that it's ongoing all the time hmm. or consistently or seasonally or, or however the, the sequence is that increase the likelihood that you can recenter and catch your breath and engage relatively well when multiple waves hit right like yeah I think there's a unfair standard that we all have I've heard it from clients I've heard I've heard it from myself where we we have an unfair expectation that we never be caught off guard I actually think right. that's survival fear right. um when instead I think from somatics it's know that you actually are knocked off balance but come back yeah really seamlessly and then yeah. masters you know they don't look like they ever get knocked off but they just it's so seamless so I'm yeah. curious on that front-loaded training you know somebody wanted to increase preparation and bandwidth that didn't look like I just need to control the game so I'm never surprised like how, yeah. what would you maybe say yeah, well, I think that's I think that's a, a wrong a wrong <laughs> a wrong and it's a wrong expectation for anybody to have. You can uh, call it how it is. We've already established you like telling it how it is. Sometimes. I know. I mean, it's such a but the thing is that's such a fragile mindset, right? And it's so easy to like if somebody gave me three minutes of their time, five minutes. I have enough experience with coaching, training, and practicing martial arts. I could break most people in five minutes or less psychologically it doesn't just need to be a physical type of thing and when you real when you've done that many times and can reproduce it you start to see that like there are extremely fragile perspectives and one of them is the assumption that you're never going to be off-footed or surprised it's like i think we can dismiss that in the next three to five minutes like it just, it takes nothing to disprove it, right? It's so simple to disprove. And, and some people operate in domains where they've gotten some skill or competence and they, um, so it happens less and that's good. But I think the challenge is that if you're looking at this with like life as a cat with a capital L and not just like domain specific, like, okay, you're a great business person. Okay. You're a super athlete. Um, then those moments where you get uh, taken off your game or fewer and fewer, but it's so common to see that somebody could be exceptional in one of these domains and horrible in another, right? There, there's an old adage amongst, you know, martial artists that the best martial artists are always single, not because they choose celibacy, but because they can't hold down a relationship. Like they're fundamentally flawed, awful people, right? At their core. And that's how they got so damn good. Um, sadly enough, I have not found somebody that I would say has disproven that. Now, there's a lot of people out there. There's probably, I am sure there are exceptions to the rule, but, you know, for my 30 years in martial arts, yeah, I've seen an awful lot of that. And you're just like, well, there is just a scope of genius here for this person, but they can't transfer the deeper principles to other domains, right? So anyway, I think that there, I think it's a bad, I think it's a bad assumption with which to tackle the, how do I not get off, you know, how do I prepare? Um, but I think a better way to look at it, uh, and then I'll reverse engineer the process. Obviously I'm heavily um, opinionated in this category. Uh, but I think a better way to look at it is clearly there is, and I like to use the term spectrum. I think it's much more useful than looking at how do I not get caught off guard versus how do I always have my, you know, how do I always have my shit together versus not? Um, okay. It's a spectrum. 
how do if I it's not yes no it's better worse right and if it's better worse how do we define that and I think one of the easiest ways to define it is when I'm presented with a trigger that I wasn't expecting uh, and that may may have impact and we can define that for ourselves the offhanded comments the uh, you know road rage the driver on the road it could be a million things the child says something stupid the spouse says something stupid i mean everybody there's mistakes happening constantly so it happens we're caught off guard and then the question a better question is not well how do i not get caught off guard okay yeah that'd be great but a better question is how quickly can i regain my sense of awareness and control and what we realize pretty quickly is when it's a big problem it might take us days right and we've all ruminated on that comment and then and then you know thought about it in the shower and just been like oh that's what i should have said that's what i should have said and then but for three days you're charged right like you can feel the adrenaline you're not sleeping properly and then if it's a lower trigger you get over it in a couple hours and if it's a very small trigger all right it's a couple of minutes this asshole on the road going to work i'm fine now i'm at work whatever so there are grades right but these aren't meaningful in themselves right the only the only meaningful um uh you know qualifier here is the impact of those things and that's largely perceptual unless you're physically assaulted on the street all of those are perceptions of an affront how much do they disagree with my sense of identity right and a, a horn honk might piss me off for five minutes because it sucks but hey it happens and somebody telling me i'm horrible at my job might bother me for two weeks uh and struck me right to the core so um so if we see the spectrum and we can see that there are grades of impact i think that's a very useful place to start then the next thing to do is i mean there's two there's two elements to that preparation and getting better at that essentially reducing the three-day impact to the one-day impact to the one-hour impact to the one-minute impact and the important thing is to recognize that could be the same stressor. What changes is your ability to process um, the impact of that stressor. So if somebody could agree with me on those points, hopefully they can. I think it's, I, I think it would be hard to deny those for ourselves. But if you can grant me that, then there's two factors to look at in terms of preparation. Uh, the first is what I try to focus on, which is mind-body capacity training. A um, lot of ways you could say that. For me, it's weightlessness. I think that's the best. There could be other modalities, yoga, martial arts, other people that have a good comprehension of nutrition, strength, flexibility, meditation. These are the four key pillars, regardless of somebody's, yeah. I'll just interject and say yours is comprehensive. I think that would be a differentiator. Weightlessness is comprehensive. I don't know too many systems that are. So sorry to I steal Oh, that's okay. I appreciate that. I consider other systems comprehensive, but lacking in minimalistic inputs. Mm -hmm. I consider yoga, I consider certain strains of martial arts to have that comprehensiveness, but they're on the 10 to 15 year track. If you want to assimilate those elements in a way that, that, that gets to the skills we're talking about and weightlessness does that by design in a 10th of the time with principle-based training. Like that's my uh, difference in priority, but I'll give uh, I'll give credit where it's due all day long to some of these other other modalities. Um, but so these four pillars are you can't you can't ignore any of them. Like they're the pillars. Like it, they speak to the deepest elements of performance uh, and how we interact with our environment. They've been there since early man, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years, and they're just as relevant today. They they are. They are what filter your, uh, you know, your brain neurology is filtered through these four pillars every day. The food that you intake, the strength and structure of your body, uh, your ability to mold and adapt flexibility, and your ability to uh, essentially manipulate attention either to a concentrated or a state of concentration or state of awareness, right? So these are the filters that we engage with the world. And these can't be hacked. Like you can try to do things better, but if you don't have a level of capacity in these categories, then the next category, uh, which I would call somatic competence, 
is useless uh, because it means that your system isn't primed enough to be able to process the stress hormones uh, and the impact of certain levels of volatility in your environment. And so no matter how much you understand what you can do in terms of connecting, perceiving the flood of emotions, being able to process them faster, release them, maybe identify points of attachment that are making you resistant to whatever's impacting you. Um, it doesn't matter. Your system is still flooded with adrenaline for, for three days. It's not, it's not a conceptual problem. Like you can't hack that part of it, but if you do both, now I think we're talking about the roadmap to go to going from three days to one day to an hour to a minute in terms of the same trigger having less and less impact. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I think. What do you think? <laughs> I think that's huge. Um, yeah, not comprehensive, but concentrated is the word that comes to mind. It's a concentrated training on those four pillars. Um, well, and I think they're built for this end. Like, I think that like my priority, and I know that, it, that it, at least within your your domain and your scope that it, that these things cross over and are a priority for you too in terms of the competence factor but i don't care if somebody's fit mm -hmm. i i don't think it matters in general other than somebody that can deadlift at 1x to 2x their body weight uh has a system that can clear a sympathetic arousal faster than somebody that doesn't that's not very complicated. If your if your system has to concentrate and organize its, you know, holistically organize its focus, strength, uh, neuromuscular coordination, build the soft tissue and the internal structures that allow you to lift that weight, and to and to exert like a one to three rep max, that's a system that can clear cortisol and adrenaline better than somebody that doesn't. It's not very complicated, but it's the same hormone profile when you get triggered. Mm -hmm. So um, that matters to me because then we're talking about how we live beyond the gym. Like, you know, this is completely out of the scope of a roided up, uh, you know, um, bodybuilder. It's just like, okay, they've got one vector, they're, they're one pillar they're, they're mastering and they're doing that well. But the value of that is that it would give them so much space in life to process, right? The Victor Frankl quote about um, between stimulus and response, there's space to choose. Strength and the pillar of strength is what buys you the space to choose. You still have to choose, right? And you have to be aware of that. And that's meditation. But the ability for your physiology to process those triggers and those stressors, that's strength. So I think I interrupted you. Sorry about well, that. I have heard you speak of this so many times, and yet I don't know that I've heard you articulate it quite like that. Um, very, very clear case for what goes where and when. Um, and then that that uh, partnership between strength and meditation, uh, the, the, the thing that allows you to have the space to choose, but then also the awareness of of the fact that you have a choice um so i'm actually glad that you you uh, interjected that 